Hi, folks. Next up on This Week in Law, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Mike Keyes and Matt Curtis. And our guest is Rick Hassan of the University of California Irvine School of Law and also of his long-running election law blog. We're going to talk about election law. We'll talk about hacking elections, both in the physical equipment we use to vote and in manipulating the voters themselves. Rick has also just authored a book on the original originalist gangsta Antonin Scalia. We'll talk about that too, much about the Supreme Court, all next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, Mike Keyes, and Matt Curtis. Episode 419, recorded April 13, 2018. One bot, one vote. Hello, I'm Denise Howell, and you're joining us for This Week in Law. I'm so excited that you're here with us this week. We have some very important topics to get to, uh, probably one of the most important topics at the intersection of law and technology. And we have one of the most uh, foremost scholars in that area of law joining us here today. Rick Hasen is joining us. He's a professor at University of California, Irvine who teaches election law. He's also uh, been blogging about election law for quite some time. And he is the author of a new book about Justice Antonin Scalia, former justice of the United States Supreme Court. It is called The Justice of Contradictions. Great to see you, Rick. Great to be with you. Uh, is election law the only thing you're teaching at UCI, or do you have other coursework that you're no, involved uh, in? I, I teach torts for mm-hmm. us, a lot of first-year students. I teach remedies, and I teach legislation and statutory interpretation. Those are my my top four classes. I also teach an undergraduate campaign finance seminar, which I just did last fall, mm-hmm. which was a lot of fun. That's very cool. Uh, so you're right in my backyard. I'm in Orange County, California, and... Uh, uh, we should talk for a second about UCI. Uh, its law school is only what five or six years old at this point, but doing really, really well as a new law we're, school. Yeah, we're actually in the ninth year, but uh, oh, nine um, years! God, I mean, that's, that's how many students we've graduated. Time flies. Uh, yeah. Uh, our founding dean, Urban Chemerinsky, left us at the end of last year to go to UC Berkeley, and we're kind of in a new chapter. And it's it's still an exciting time. It's a new school, but now we've got graduates and alumni and. We're ranked in U.S. News. I guess we really exist. <laughs> you really, really exist. I think UCI is uh, <laughs> is is the best kept secret of the University of California system. It's it's in this wonderful location. It's got a great vibe to the campus. Um, so shh, uh, yeah. keep it quiet, and it'll it'll stay cool. I think the hundred thousand undergraduates that applied in the uh, in this past year found out the secret. They're on, they're <laughs> onto it, aren't they? Yep. Uh, it's it's a great place to go to school because uh, it's not. Um, I'd, I'd say UC San Diego is is closer to the coast. It's basically right on the coast, but UC Irvine's a close second. So if you're a student there, um, you can live in fun beachfront housing and have a a pretty nice time for yourself uh, if that winds up working out for you. Um, I'm sure that that sounds pretty attractive to our uh, my co-host, Matt Curtis, who is a law student at Notre Dame. <laughs> we are celebrating our first 70 degree day in uh, 185 days. I just made up the 185 days, but I think it's true. Um, <laughs> and so there's a lot of people walking around with shorts and chacos and uh, they still fit from last year, hopefully, because we don't get much occasion. So uh, yeah, I'm very jealous of the UC Irvine campus. I, I wish we would have had this call before I chose my law school, <laughs> at least for the weather. <laughs> I know. And then then we could have met uh, in person instead of yeah. regularly via Skype. We, we still have to do that at some point, of course. Yeah. Mike Keyes and I have met in person uh, when he visited Orange County. Uh, Mike Keyes is yes, a partner have. at uh, Dorsey and Whitney in Seattle. Uh, another another fairly chilly place to hang out, but uh, how is it there today? Uh, it's, uh, as you would expect, cloudy and rainy, but uh, hope springs eternal. I'm sure the sun will come out at some point. 
Well, we're, we're pulling for you there, Mike. All right, well, uh, one thing, speaking of sunlight, uh, we're gonna talk about, uh, as I said, one of the most important issues at the intersection of law and technology is uh, how our voting systems work in the United States and, and what the status of uh, those systems is as far as security, uh, reliability, age, uh, and, and what the laws are that govern all that and help uh, ensure us and assure us that our elections are something that we can have faith and trust in. And uh, so we're very pleased to have Rick here, who, as I said, has been blogging about these issues and studying them for years and years and is uh, one of the foremost folks uh, in the world to discuss those topics. So let's jump right into that. Rick, I kind of wanted to start out our discussion um, on the hardware front, hardware hacking front. Uh, the stat, the status of the actual um, systems that we use to vote, and uh, the laws that govern them, and sort of where we stand, and then uh, we'll move uh, from that discussion into sort of the more uh, software or wetware hacking front, and by that I mean hacking us as individuals <laughs> and uh, trying to control the way votes go. That way, but let's let's start with the equipment. Um, I think you know, unless you've not been paying attention to this issue at all, I think that people are are fairly aware that the voting systems in the United States are in kind of a scary state. Uh, there was a time, I think, when we were trying to move away from paper voting and paper ballots and hanging chads and the nightmare that all of that can entail and two more electronic voting systems. But as we did, we ran into problems, didn't we? So the 2000 election showed how terrible our voting system was technologically speaking. That You mentioned the hanging chads just for younger people who might not know, uh, people uh, in many places, including in Los Angeles County where I live, were casting their ballots on machines that uh, had you take a little stick called a stylus and you, you punched out an IBM computer card, um, which had little uh, um, perforated areas called, uh, and little pieces of a comic called a chad. These would be punched out, you'd feed uh, eventually, as the election officials would feed these into machines and, and, and you'd get a count that way, and they turned out to be incredibly inaccurate. Uh, how inaccurate? We know that in the 2003 California recall, which was the last time they were used in California, that um, there were only a few questions on the ballot. One of them was, uh, do you favor recall of the governor, uh, yes or no? And in uh, Alameda County, where they voted on electronic voting machines, there was uh, 0.75. So three quarters of 1% of people didn't vote on that question. And in LA, it was recorded as 9% of people did not vote on that question. So these machines were terrible. They did not count votes well. So what happened after 2000, and we saw all the problems with how our elections were run, Congress came up with a bunch of money. Machines were replaced in a lot of places. Unfortunately, they were placed with, in some places, with electronic voting machines that don't produce a paper trail. And so a recount essentially consists of pushing a button. And you know there are concerns about security there were concerns about this before the Russian hacking, but you know, there are concerns now. The key point is that we don't run our elections using uniform machinery or uniform software. Every state, every county, sometimes sub-county levels, pick their own machinery. It has to be subject to certain standards, but there's a, a wide variety in how things are done. And well, there's two kinds of machines. There are machines by which people cast votes, and then there are the machines that count the ballots when they're already cast. And we've seen problems in both of those areas. Uh, right now, a lot of the machinery is getting to the end of its useful life. And uh, election officials have been begging for more money. Now, finally, Congress in its uh, most recent um, spending bill came up with some money to try to fix this problem. But it, it seems to be a pretty dire problem. But we've got lots of voting machinery that's not secure, uh, that uh, maybe uh, leaves open the ability of 
people with malicious intent to do something to, if not change vote totals, at least mess up our either our voter registration systems or confidence in the public process so that voting does not go smoothly. And that could lead to all kinds of social and political problems. Right. So uh, I, I know there are some who subscribe to the theory that the fact that we have such a non-uniform voting landscape in the United States uh, is actually a feature rather than a bug, uh, that it would be hard to um, do significant damage uh, if you couldn't zero in on a critical mass of all those different kinds of technologies being used to uh, both lodge the votes and count the votes. Uh, what's your take on that? So kind of blockchain for uh, yes, elections? kind of, exactly. Um, I don't subscribe very uh, highly, I don't think very highly of that theory uh, for a couple uh -huh. of reasons. One is while things are decentralized, um, the resources are not adequate in a lot of places and the training is not adequate. And so mm -hmm. um, we can't be assured that everybody's doing a good job because they don't always have what they need to do a good job or the money, uh, the, the stuff they need to do a good job. Uh, and, and second, uh, if you want to mess up a presidential election, you don't have to mess up the votes in Nebraska or New Jersey. It might be enough to do it in Wisconsin. And so mm -hmm. just because it's decentralized, uh, you might look for the place where it might matter the most, and if they, there happens to be a vulnerability, you can go there. So you know, I think you know, diversity and decentralization are valuable things, but not necessarily in how you run elections. Certainly, we should have redundancy, and so that you know, there's not one place where everything is kept, uh, so we can make sure that things are accurate. But we have not just a multiplicity of um, jurisdictions; we have a multiplicity of talents and resources, and so uh, people are going to look who want to mess things up at the weakest links. Okay, I think that's a, a great response. Um, I, I also have a question for you. We have a ton of links. Uh, if you're interested in the issues we're discussing here today, they're all publicly available at tagpacker.com slash user slash This Week in Law. Look up episode 419. Uh, and you mentioned a moment ago, and all these links talk about having a paper trail and and the critical uh, fact that quite a few states use and some of them exclusively use voting systems that don't have a paper trail. What does it mean to have a paper trail, Rick? And are we talking about physical pieces of paper? We are talking about physical pieces of paper. So mm -hmm. in parts of Pennsylvania, in many parts of Pennsylvania, this is about to change, but you go in and you vote on what looks kind of like an ATM machine. You cast your ballots and then the machine records those votes and then those votes are then aggregated. Uh, and a, a recount consists of pushing the button again that gives you the vote totals. A paper trail would give you a piece of paper that would print out your totals. Those totals could then be checked if there were an audit. And one of the things we think is really important is having post-election audits to make sure that the votes that are physically present match what the totals are that are being computed electronically. So mm -hmm. um, uh, there are surprisingly lots of places uh, where there is no paper trail and where there are concerns about security. Pennsylvania is one, Georgia is another one. And uh, unlike Pennsylvania, G Georgia has been resisting uh, making changes. There's actually some lawsuits that have been filed arguing that you know, we can't really tell who the uh, proper winners are in elections if we can't have that piece of paper to verify what's going on. Right, uh, there are many who are, are wringing their hands about the state of the United States voting systems, uh, the age of the machinery in use, the fact that uh, having an auditable paper trail uh, isn't uh, a universal fact. Uh, one of our pieces uh, from the Brennan Center in the rundown today uh, mentions that there are only three states that are that require what is considered by experts to be the gold standard of auditing. Could you describe what that gold standard is, if you know? Well, I only know that I'm not a I'm not a technical voting person. I deal with the kind of the legal side of things. But the idea mm -hmm. is uh, you want to after the election 
do random audits uh, in select precincts to make sure that the vote totals that are coming out match uh, what has been reported. Let me, let me give you one example where we know this was a problem. You may remember at the end of the 2016 election, Jill Stein, who was the, the Green Party candidate for uh, president, she requested recounts in uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. And in Michigan, they started to do the recount. And in the Detroit area, the vote equipment and training was so bad, they literally could not do a recount uh, because they, um, uh, the, the numbers that they reported did not, the number of ballots, total votes they reported did not match the number of ballots that were supposedly put in the machines. And this led to all kinds of crazy claims of vo voter fraud and Fox and Friends was out there. There's all kinds of stuff saying that you know, the, the election was being stolen for Hillary Clinton. Uh, there was an investigation by the Michigan uh, election people, and it turned out to be a lot of inadequate training of poll workers. And so uh, where were the missing ballots? They were just never run through the machine. They were actually sitting in the machine, and nobody took them out and actually ran them through the machine that counts the ballots. I mean, very basic training not taking place. And so when you do audits, you can look to make sure that this is not a regular occurrence. And, uh, you know, hopefully by doing that, uh, states will get their act together. And I think now that people are paying attention, they're going to be less likely to be able to get away with shoddy election administration than they may have been able to do in the past. So what does the legal landscape look like, Rick? I'm sure that this is an area where states have their own laws and the federal government obviously has a considerable interest in making sure that elections are run accurately and securely. Uh, so I imagine there's some conflict between the laws of the two from time to time and some uh, stepping on toes of the states by the federal government or states saying, you know, if this is one of the most fundamental things we can do as a state is control our own elections. So get out of our business. How does that all look? Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of tension sometimes between federal and state, sometimes between state and local, the federal government, uh, through the, these laws that Congress has passed has basically given a, an agency, the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, the power to decide which voting machines are certified and then to provide money for certified machines, but leaving other issues to the states. There are certain requirements as to how ballots need to be uh, handled. Um, but most of this is a matter of state law. And a lot of the state laws have not necessarily been updated to deal with the changes in technology. And so we're finding some holes in the laws as we look and uh, I, I've been saying for a long time, this goes back to the 2003 recall, that in addition to doing audits to make sure that the counting is done right, we need to do audits of our election laws to make sure that they are done right. So back in 2003, I pointed out that, I don't know if you remember this, there were 135 candidates on the ballot, including Gary Coleman from Different Strokes and Gallagher, the, right. and uh, there was, the, uh, there was uh, a porn star, uh, you know, Governor Schwarzenegger ends up coming in from that. Well, how did that happen? That happened because um, <laughs> the uh, the election code in California was not written well. So uh, if you looked at the recall election rules, it says use the primary, the rules that generally apply to a primary, which uh, just meant um, $3,500 uh, and 60 signatures, which made it very easy, you know, if you want to get some publicity to appear on the ballot. If you turned to the primary rules, the very first rule says these rules do not apply to recall elections. You know, so the law itself was a mess and, you know, it still hasn't been fixed. And so a lot of the problems that we could potentially see in the future are not just going to come from technology problems, but from the fact that the laws have not been checked to make sure that they match the technology in terms of, for example, how you're supposed to conduct a recount. So there's a lot to do on the state and local level to make sure that everything lines up in the event of a very close election, because we know that in this very polarized times, people's confidence in the election process is lower and people are suspicious when their person loses. So I want to make sure the rules are as clear and as well done as possible in advance. It, it seems like we're moving further and further away from the days uh, that I think people thought we would be headed toward when you could pretty much vote uh, wherever you were from whatever device happened to be handy for you. Um, I, that distant 
future seems to be receding at a rapid rate. Yeah, Would you I, agree? I think there's, I think there's a general consensus that internet voting is not nearly secure enough to, as a mm-hmm. viable option. But I point out in Los Angeles County, they're working on a brand new voting system. They've been working on it for years. They're going to roll it out soon. But one of the things you'll be able to do is to pre-fill out your ballot on your smartphone. It'll generate a QR code. You'll be able to go into a voting center, scan that QR code, and it will print a uh, a paper, a piece of paper that shows all your votes. So you can well, that's pretty do cool. everything uh, in the uh, you know uh, in the cafe, whatever, and then go in and have your ballot printed out. You can also vote by mail uh, with a different format. But uh, you know this thing about being able to use the phone is is great because it also allows for people with uh, different languages or various uh, physical disabilities to be able to use the technology. And the best part is to me it it leads to a piece of paper, which can then be checked in the event of, uh, of, a, of an audit and can be actually counted uh, through these counting machines. Yeah, I have questions about voting by mail that I want to get to for sure. But I'm sure Mike and Matt want to ask you some things about our voting technology as well. Matt, why don't you fire something off? Yeah, so I think the technology questions are really interesting. But like, can, can you break down for us? Um, I know that it has to do with federalism, but why, from a uh, a legal perspective, is this not centralized in the in the federal government? Like, creating a top down system, and you know they're giving out grants instead of uh, passing laws about this. Can Can you explain to us the uh, the the constitutional or the federalism concerns that 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 brought us to the situation? Well, there's actually not a big constitutional concern. The Constitution gives Congress the power to set the rules for a congressional election. So Congress could mandate uniformity. Um, They could mandate a certain kind of machine be used. Uh, But they don't because there's been this turf war. We've had this long history of local control. The, The Constitution says that in federal elections, Congress sets the rules for elections and the states set the rules for the qualifications of voters. And so as long as you don't impinge on that, rule about the qualifications of voters, then uh, you're okay. And there's, there's a lawsuit pending right now involving the Secretary of State of Air, uh, of, uh, of Kansas, Chris Kobach, who's been in the news a lot. He was uh, uh, involved with Trump's um, voting commission that's now been disbanded. Uh, but what uh, Kobach is trying to do, and there was just a, a, a trial and we're waiting for a decision, uh, the federal... Uh, statute says that anybody who wants to register in a federal election can use a postcard that the federal government designs, the Election Assistance Commission designs. And that postcard does not require that you produce any documentary proof of citizenship, like your naturalization papers or your birth certificate. And a few states, including Kansas, are arguing, we need this to stop non-citizens from voting in our elections. And uh, that is impinging on our ability to set the qualifications for voters. And so this trial that just took place in Kansas a few weeks ago was looking at do states like Kansas really need to be able to require documentary proof of citizenship to require lots of non-citizen voting? And, you know, one of the things that came out of the trial is that there's not any good proof that non-citizens are voting in in, in droves uh, for the obvious reason that doing so would be a felony and it's very hard to swing an election. And uh, that's not what most people do. Um, But this is the place where Congress sets the rules under its powers to set the rules for congressional elections where it butts heads against states' power to set qualifications. But it's a tremendous political uh, lobbying being done uh, to stop any federal legislation by state and local officials who do not want their power to set these rules being taken away. Mike, any questions? Yeah, Rick. So, I mean, it sounds like a pretty complicated landscape when it comes to the various legal regimes. You'd you'd mentioned earlier that the feds will provide subsidies to the states if they improve um, improve their voting machines, uh, or, or or I guess they set the rules for certification of of certain voting machines. Can you explain that a little bit more? And and I guess as a follow along to that, if states are able to get updated voting machines um, and have the government subsidize that, why why have states not uh, kind of gotten their acts together to do that? So the first round of uh, changes came in 2002 after Bush versus Gore, after the 2000 election, in something called the Help America Vote Act. It said you can get your money if you, um, uh, get, you know, buy these certified machines. 
So the election Systems commission had to figure out which, which machines work. Lots of places did that. Um, and what's happening now is uh, those machines have reached the end of their useful life. Some of those machines don't have the paper trail, and so they're problematic even if they haven't reached the end of their useful life. And now we may be going through, thanks to this new grant from uh, this congressional bill, uh, we'll be going through another round of this. So, uh, you know, 2002, 2003, it's a while ago, if we think about technology, uh, you know, there are lots of things. If we had to use 2002, 2003 technology uh, in our everyday lives, we probably wouldn't be too happy. We probably wouldn't be even having this conversation the way we are right now. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no Skype wow. in 03, I think. <laughs> Certainly no TriCasters. Um, so one of the uh, proposals uh, in our rundown today <coughs> is, an, this is an op-ed in the Washington Post by Michael Chertoff, who's former Secretary of Homeland Security and Grover Norquist, who's the President of Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, they think that we should just go back to paper ballots. And we started the show talking about, well, those had their issues too. Um, what do you think of this proposal, Rick? So the reason we moved to uh, electronic counting of ballots, at least, uh, mm -hmm. is because there was fraud, you know, literal ballot box stuffing. You know, that's not just a metaphor that, you know, that literally happened, you know, fill out some more mm -hmm. papers, stick them in the ballot box. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the, you know, the punch card, the hanging chads, that was seen as a, a great improvement on what we had before. The biggest impediment to just simply voting on paper is uh, uh, the, uh, and, then, uh, 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 and then hand count. They, they want to hand count all these ballots is the length of the ballot. So in California, uh, as you know, Denise, you could vote on 30 things, more. <laughs> so many different races, ballot propositions. And for all of that to be hand counted, uh, you know, the chances of humans making errors are much greater, you know, much more uh, secure uh, and sensible is do machine counts and then do post-election audits to make sure that the machine counts are accurate. Um, in Canada, you know, they do, they still count by hand, but they're not, you know, in their national elections, but they're not voting on as many things as we are, and they have a centralized system. Everything's the same everywhere in Canada when they, when they, when the way most democracies conduct their elections. It's just not very practical for here. But certainly, I agree. We should. There should be a piece of paper that could always be checked. And, and even then, of course, then it creates problems. I had the Orange County uh, Registrar come in and sh uh, to my election law class and show my students some ballots. You know where uh, somebody had bubbled in a, you know, a, 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 like a scantron. Uh, they bubbled mm -hmm. in a choice and then put an X through it and then bubbled in another choice. Uh, you know, what do you do about that? Uh, you know, what do you do about uh, people who uh, bubble in a choice and then bubble in the write-in uh, area and write in the name of the same candidate? You know, so uh, that, you know, a machine would count that as an overvote, but a human might count that as a vote for a candidate. So, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, if you're going to count with paper, you're going to count with machines. There's no perfect way, especially when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands or even millions of votes being counted and cast. Right, so Chertoff and Norquist assert that uh, if they can get momentum for this thought, and apparently President Trump is behind this uh, proposal as well um, and has made some comments about uh, his fondness for paper ballots. But the cost, uh, they say, they spin it as for the cost of a single F-22 fighter jet, we could replace all paperless voting machines in the United States. Uh, that's about $339 million. I looked it up. <laughs> yeah, so, that's not relevant. Yeah. Well, there is, there is money to replace these machines that's now come since they wrote that. Uh, you know, there is money coming from Congress. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, it's a start. Uh, and right. I, I, I completely agree that... Um, we shouldn't be cheap with running our election system. We've got to be um, really careful because we're in such a polarized time, because we have irresponsible people like the president making claims that um, there's millions of people engaged in voter fraud, that there's, uh, uh, you know, that there are problems with uh, uh, hacking. We need to have a secure system and one that people can have confidence in. And, you know, that's really what is, um, uh, at the heart of a democracy is the people's confidence 
that if you're a loser, it was a fair election and your vote was fairly and accurately counted. I mean, you can say in a sentence what the goal should be. Every voting system should be designed so that every eligible voter, but only eligible voters, can easily cast a ballot, which will be fairly and accurately counted. Very easy to say, but lots of disagreement about how to do it and lots of problems with getting the resources and the training so that it actually happens. You mentioned the Orange County Registrar of Voters, Neil Kelly. Uh, He pops up in one of the pieces that we have in the rundown, the um, Politico piece. Uh, and and popped up just to depress the heck out of me as I was reading that. I was thinking, well, here we are in California. We're in a well-funded state that pays attention to such things. We've probably, maybe we're doing that gold standard of auditing. We're one of those um, three states. Neil Kelly, though, comes along and is quoted in this article um, saying that many machines in California are so old they can't be repaired and the sky is really falling, he says. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, we are we are not in great shape. Um, let's let's talk good, for good a moment. We don't have Go any ahead. competitive elections coming up in Orange County. Yes, you know, control, very good of, thing. control of control of the um, Congress may come down to what happens in Orange County. That's very there true. These, there are these uh, red districts that could turn blue. Uh, at least there's a lot of energy on the Democratic side, and so we don't know. But um, be a lot of pressure on Neil. And you know, I think Neil does a great job with what he has to work with, but he needs a lot more money. Yeah, that's I'm a sure really good I'm point. Sure he wouldn't dis- I'm sure he wouldn't disagree with me saying, saying that. Well, Orange County, uh, for the first time, well, you probably know this better than I do, uh, for the first time since the 1930s, I think it was, voted for a Democratic presidential candidate in the last election, voted for Hillary Clinton. Yeah, um, it's, not your, it's not your grandfather's Orange County. No, it is not. <laughs> uh, all right, let's. I wanted to talk about um, uh, voting by mail, which used to be referred to as an absentee ballot. Uh, but as someone who has voted by mail for years and has never been absent when doing so, it's just become the for me the convenient way to vote. And I I wonder, you know, if there are issues with the uh, security of that system um, that we should be paying attention to. So the big move now is to stop calling it vote by mail or absentee ballot and call it vote at home. Mm. I think part of that is don't, as with the president, don't trust the postal service. Uh, So Mm -hmm. in a lot of these places where they're moving to all vote by mail, like Colorado or uh, Washington, um, there are dedicated boxes, which are not Mm -hmm. run by the US Postal Service where you could return your ballots. Um, So, Lots of people love this in California. About half of voters regularly vote by mail. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's convenient. You have you can vote in the in the uh, you know privacy of your own home at at your own time. That's all great. But there's are there are downsides too. Uh, So one downside is that um, lots of ballots of people who vote by mail are. not counted because people make technical mistakes in how they cast their ballots. They forget to sign the envelope or they do something else wrong and their ballot's not counted. And in some places you're not even notified. California's gotten better about this. You're not even notified that you're, you, you had an error and not mm-hmm. given a chance to fix it. Uh, so that's one problem. Another problem is anytime you have voting outside of a polling place with a secret ballot, you run the risk of vote buying. So for example, uh, I'll give you 20 bucks, you give me your blank ballot, I'll vote it for you. Or I'm gonna watch how you vote and I'm gonna vote this way. Now, Mm -hmm. voter fraud in the United States, this is a big topic, probably not for this uh, show, but voter fraud in the United States is pretty rare uh, when it comes to impersonating other people, uh, extremely rare. But when voter fraud does happen, it happens more with absentee ballots than with anything else. Because Mm -hmm. you're out of the voting booth, ballots can be bought and sold. Now, part of this is, uh, you know, I think a history of, Problems. There are parts in the country, uh, parts of Florida, parts of Texas, parts of Appalachia, where there has been this tradition of, of uh, vote buying with absentee ballots. It does not ha- seem to have been a problem in California or in Oregon or in Colorado or in Washington. But it's something to keep an eye on as it becomes more popular. Um, and as the post office becomes less reliable, uh, I think there's going to be more of a move to set up these dedicated places to drop off your ballot rather than uh, sticking it in the U.S. mail, 
Uh, it's going to be the election officials who are going to collect those ballots. And so then you have to worry about the security of those ballot boxes. Are they sitting on a street? Are people watching them? Can the ballot box be stolen? So uh, never underestimate the ability of people to think about dirty tricks to try to uh, sway an election. So I was unaware, both California, sorry, uh, Washington and Colorado have a, you, a solely vote by mail system? Oregon, yep. yep. Oregon. <clears throat> Oregon. And, and, and Washington too, isn't that right? Oregon, right? Washington, and Colorado. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I voted by mail for, or voted from home for years now. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's interesting. You know, I had um, you. You were mentioning some of the the flaws or issues associated with at home um, balloting. I, I've had uh, the experience on more than one occasion, which was was actually comforting in in some respects. That um, when I signed my ballot, it, I received notice that it was rejected because the signature on my ballot didn't match the signature card that the county had on record for me. That happened at least twice to me. Um, mm -hmm. So it was surprising that that people actually do go through to that level of detail and compare the signature that they had on file for you versus um, what was ultimately submitted on the ballot. And this is a huge problem because uh, I don't know about you, but my signature has really deteriorated as I <laughs> write much less. And so if you sign something 20 yeah. years ago with your signature, the, the idea that your signature is going to look anything like it did now, you know, think 20 years from now when we're not writing anything and we're not driving anywhere. Right, so we can't use our driver's license for ID for voting, and our signature doesn't really identify us. Uh, are we going to go biometric? What are we going to do so that we know that somebody who's cast a ballot is actually, you know, by mail is actually the person uh, who he or she says he is? So I right. think that we're seeing more and more complaints about signatures not matching, and um, everybody's signature changes over time. I, I found stuff I wrote, uh, you know, 20 years ago. I signed a letter. It doesn't look anything like my signature right now. And yet I probably have not put in a new um, signature to election officials for 20 years. Yeah, so my solution was I actually got a copy of the, the signature that the county has on file. And I actually keep that with me. Um, and I make sure that my ballot, I, I make my signature just like it looks on the, uh, uh, on the record with the county. Yeah, I've been using that to cash some checks, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and as I understand it, with more and more of these electronic signature credit card machines that we're all scrawling on as best we can because they don't really let you write very effectively uh, on those touch screens, that people are just drawing pictures, you know, a oh, cat yeah. or something obscene <laughs> as their signature. Uh my, my signature is a smiley face and has been for the last 10 years. Like right. I, I, I've, I've never signed the credit card thing. It, right. It's just, and no, and they've never stopped me from buying something. You can't even if you want to, it's such a poor technology. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I love that, that uh, point that you made Rick, that in 20 years, you know, we may not have driver's licenses and no one will be able to write anything. <laughs> So what do but we do? Yeah, there'll be there'll be an eye scan, and we'll have my, we'll, we'll be microchipped by then, so it'll be easy to keep track of us. Right. Uh, what what happens with um? So we have on one hand states that only allow you to vote by mail. In caucus states, though, that seems completely counter to how they want to run their elections, isn't it? Is, well, isn't caucus, caucus just for primaries? Caucuses are for primaries, but there are a number of states that the caucuses are instead of primaries. I should say in some places. There are a mm -hmm. number of states that do not allow absentee balloting at all unless mm -hmm. you have a disability or you're out of the country and have a good excuse. So mm -hmm. you can think of New York. New York, you know, you don't hear much about New York as a vote suppressor. You know, you hear it about uh, states where there's, um, you know, a Republican legislature and the Democrats are complaining that uh, the rules are too tough. New York, uh, which is a Democratic state, is one of the very worst states in the country for election administration. And there's a kind of a political machine in Albany that has not allowed for changes. No early voting in New York, the same in Pennsylvania. You know, you don't have a two week period to vote. You gotta vote on election day in person unless you have an excuse. And I think it's really inexcusable given how our lives are today. It should not be that it comes down to the serendipity that you're available on that particular Tuesday or you're gonna be disenfranchised. Uh, and, 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 uh, especially for working people, there, there should be other options. Didn't New York have the law against taking selfies in a in a ballot last year when that came up? 
Yes. Uh, so, yes, I, I'm probably on the, the other side of that issue from some other people. I think ballot selfies should not be allowed um, mm. for the same reason I'm concerned about um, absentee ballot fraud. Once you mm -hmm. can verify how you voted, you allow for the transaction to take place where someone could buy your vote or coerce you to vote in a particular way. And so while I think that, you know, it's great for people to celebrate voting, they shouldn't do it with a picture of their actually voted ballot. And and we don't have consistency on that front around the country, right? I, I know we tried to, uh, in connection with the last election, give some people some guidance on that. And I think where we came down was you just have to check your local rules and right. figure out if it's okay or not. It's just like the rules on electioneering at the polls. It's a state by state thing uh, mm -hmm. rather than a national rule. Okay. Well, I think we need to come together and figure out a uh, passphrase, an MCLE, an MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law. We're going to put two of these in the show. We do this if you are a lawyer or other professional in the United States who likes to watch or listen to the show to receive professional credit in your field. And we put these phrases in because there are some jurisdictions who liked you to be able to demonstrate that you actually watched or listened to the show. Uh, how about don't snap that ballot or don't selfie that ballot as our first like phrase. It. If you're looking for uh, more information about this, you can head on over to our wiki at wiki.twit.tv. Find This Week in Law there, and we've got a chart uh, for lawyers in the United States that should help you figure out uh, if it's worth your while to try and submit for credit in your jurisdiction. We are not an approved provider, so this is on you going to your uh, bar or whoever administers MCLE for you and uh, seeing if they will give you credit for watching or listening to This Week in Law. We get great people on the show like Rick Hasen today uh, talking about really important issues. So uh, take a shot at it. And if you need support from us, we're happy to provide you with whatever documentation you might need to back that up. All right, uh, let's see. Let's just go around once and see if we have any more questions or comments on the topic of uh, voting systems themselves and their security. I guess my last topic is, or, or comment is um, that every year when DEF CON happens, uh, the hackers there take great joy and glee in demonstrating the hackability of these systems, how easily they're able to breach what are supposed to be secure systems. I believe the last time it happened, they, they managed to hack one that was uh, a model that was actually in service in various states, and they were able to show um, how very vulnerable it was. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that these systems are secure. And uh, you mentioned, I guess, Rick, that um, we have uh, that funding was just voted by the federal government to help uh, this situation. Can you describe that for us in a little bit more detail, how the states are going to get this money, et cetera? Uh, well, I don't know if you can hear me because now the uh, the tree trimming has reached its crescendo. Uh, but assuming <laughs> you can hear me. Yes. You hope. Um, we, you hope we it's can. Your, your send, yeah. You sound good. All right, good. I'm not focused on the the details of this. I uh, I think it's about $380 million, and I believe it is being used for uh, similar purposes as the HABA round to replace uh, voting equipment that uh, is out of date and especially to provide for a paper trail. But I did want to take a minute and talk about, um, you know, what is it that could be hacked? So remember, mm -hmm. we're talking about two different kinds of systems. One is a system by which you cast your vote. And lots of those places you're using a paper and pencil um, to fill out a Scantron. And something like that, there's no hacking uh, possibility. Um, but then the machines are fed into... Um, uh, I mean, the papers are fed into a machine that then reads. And with those uh, the, those counting machines, that's where uh, has been one place where there's been some concerns about how this works. Of course, if you have electronic voting machines, then there are two places where the hacking could take place. Election officials say that the machines are generally not connected to the Internet. They're standalone machines. This is nothing to worry about. There's a troubling piece. I don't know if it's in... Uh, your list of pieces of a troubling piece 
uh, in the New York Times Magazine by Kim Vetter uh, that appeared uh, maybe a month or two ago, where it turns out that um, these machines get software updates. So when they get software updates, not during the elections, but before the election, that is a place where there is a potential vulnerability. And so uh, really, uh, the question is, uh, what can state officials do uh, and how much support are they going to get from the federal government to uh, uh, make sure that they're proactively taking steps? Because we know that 20 or 21 states had their voter registration databases, yet another component of the election system, uh, probed or somehow uh, messed with by what we think were Russian government agents. And so there's a lot of work to be done. Voting is one of the most complicated things we do. It's like an army that has to get together for this very short period for this very important purpose, and then it lays dormant for a while. And so uh, th there's, um, there are many places where there are vulnerabilities, and it really has to be addressed the way any other piece of critical infrastructure is addressed. All right, Mike, any final thoughts on this topic before we move on? Well, I, I guess I do have a question in light of what you were just saying, Rick, as far as the the state uh, the state databases and the the probing by Russians and others. Um, what what exactly was entailed in that, and is there any evidence that this uh, probing led to any sort of of um, any sort of difference in the actual vote tallies or counts? So even if they were able to mess with the voter registration, it wouldn't have affected the counts. What it might have affected is someone's ability to vote on election day. So, for example, if somebody's address was changed or their name was changed. We don't see any evidence of that. There was one state, uh, Illinois, there was just a story on 60 Minutes uh, where they talked to some of the Illinois people where it looked like uh, the Russians tried to go in and change actual names and that this was caught and fixed. Most of the places it was just probing. Some people think it was done in such a way not to actually change vote totals, but just to mess with people's confidence in the process. Like once mm -hmm. this information comes out that all this stuff is going on, uh, people are going to think, oh, maybe the vote totals were hacked. And so it's kind of a psychological warfare more than actually doing something that would manipulate vote totals that would actually affect the outcome directly. Well, even if they weren't manipulating vote totals, if you're looking at voter registration records, you can see what party someone is registered for, correct? It depends on the state, but not every mm -hmm. state has registration by party. But you'd see, ah. you'd see name, address, party registration. You might see some voter history, where did they used to live, things like that. Uh, you right. know, which raises issues of voter, uh, which raises issues of identity theft aside from anything else. I mean, these mm -hmm. systems need to be secured for a lot of reasons. But if you wanted to target all the Republicans in Orange County, for example. Well, you, could, and you can do that you, anyway, because you yeah. can go in and you can buy that information. Uh, you, mm. know, uh, uh, you know, a, a more effective targeting would be kind of the targeting we saw on Facebook, where, uh, you know, you look at what people are clicking on, you see what state they're in, and you figure out what uh, messages to send to them. Probably a more efficient mm -hmm. way than trying to hack into the voter registration database. Got it. Uh, Matt, any final thoughts or questions? Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate Rick's points that um, you know the the unique thing about this is that it's a very critical piece of infrastructure, and but it starts up and stops. Um, so you know you don't worry about systems like um, payment through Amazon or something like that because they do it every day and it's regular routine. It's just hard to start a system and, and then like completely stop it. Um, and the other thing is that you know Russia has gotten like incredible bang for buck their buck by just the uncertainty around um, whether. You know, someone whether it was tampered with or not, and, and actually going like that's causing more disruption in, in American politics than uh, perhaps even if they did successfully uh, sway the election, um, just because all, all the uncertainty around it. So um, yeah, I just it's it, it's a hard system to get right, and I, I I certainly don't know how to do it. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, Rick, was the conference that just happened at UCI on vote hacking last month on March 13th, James Carville was the keynote speaker. Were there any takeaways from that uh, that you'd like to share with us today? I wish I knew. I was actually <laughs> teaching during the time, unfortunately. Uh, one of the Aww. organizers had thought I was, uh, uh, they had thought I was on sabbatical and out of the country. Uh, so, ah. uh, so unfortunately I didn't get to attend. Uh, I heard it was a great event, but I, I don't really know any details. I've been so busy with my book tour traveling all over the country talking about Justice Scalia that 
I, I, some, of, some of the things I would normally be keeping up on, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit behind. Got it. All right. Well, I just wanted to make sure to, to pick your brain on that if you had anything to add about it. Uh, let's move on to, we were starting to talk a bit about uh, manipulating people through either um, their uncertainty about the sanctity of the voting system or or affirmatively uh, trying to sway their vote. What does the legal landscape look like there? I guess it starts with our voter advertising laws. So uh, what we're talking about primarily with this has been uh, potential campaign finance violations. And so if you're a foreign government or a foreign corporation or a foreign individual who's not a lawful permanent resident of the United States, you're not allowed to spend money on our elections. So you can't run an ad that says, you know, vote for Clinton, vote for Trump. Um, mm-hmm. You also can't run certain issue ads on TV or radio that would say, you know, Trump's a great leader or Hillary Clinton uh, is, uh, you know, did a great job as secretary of state in the period before the election. The McCain-Feingold law in 2002 said those would count the same as election ads. But McCain-Feingold didn't extend to digital. And so uh, there's nothing right now uh, on our um, in our federal laws that would prevent uh, say a foreign government or foreign entity or individual from running ads that, uh, for example, one said Hillary is a Satan, uh, not covered by the law apparently. And uh, uh, we know that a lot of the manipulation that supposedly took place from the Russians didn't even mention candidates at all. It uh, instead tried to get people riled up, you know, organized rallies for and against different immigration issues or gay rights uh, or Black Lives Matter. Uh, So there's a lot of fomenting of popular unrest. There's a lot of pushing Trump, uh, but much of that behavior is not illegal. Some of that would be caught by this Honest Ads Act, which is a federal law that uh, Senator Klobuchar is spearheading. Uh, It's the law that Facebook and Twitter both said they supported this week. But it actually goes much beyond that uh, in terms of what the Uh, Russians apparently did in the last election. And even if it passes, there will be plenty of room for uh, uh, outside uh, agents to continue to do this. In fact, I had a post on uh, the election law blog uh, in the last week where I talked about how uh, Facebook says it's going to go further, says it's going to regulate these issue ads, but uh, uh, their post uh, raises a lot more in terms of uh, questions about how they're going to do it than it actually answered. And so it's really uncertain Uh, period that we're going into right now. So let's go into the Honest Ads Act a little bit. Um, Its goal is for people to be able to, if they see an ad online, uh, much like if you see one on TV, there are various disclosures about that are mandated about um, who has paid for that ad and why you're seeing it. Um, Some of the, it seems like the online landscape would, would mirror that a bit more under this Honest Ads Act. Am I getting that right? Well, no, there are a number of provisions, but the key one is the one that extends the McCain-Feingold electioneering communications provision. So let me just mm-hmm. define that. So it turned out, say, if we go back to the late 1990s, there were lots of ads that weren't covered by our election laws in terms of disclosure or limits on who could pay for them. Um, they didn't mention a can't. They, they, they didn't. Uh, they didn't include express advocacy. They didn't say vote for this candidate or vote against this candidate, but they did feature the candidate. So Bill Clinton famously ran ads uh, calling on Bob Dole to stop, it was the DNC running these actually, calling on Bob Dole to stop scaring seniors. And so uh, this was an election ad, it just didn't say vote for Clinton or vote against Dole. And so what mm-hmm. McCain Feingold did is said, we're gonna treat ads that are broadcast on TV, radio, satellite, cable, within the 60 days before the election that could reach 50,000 people, if they mention a candidate, we're treating them as an election ad, which among other things means that foreign entities can't pay for them. It also meant at the time that corporations and unions couldn't pay for them, but that part was later overturned in the Citizens United case. Mm -hmm. Uh, The McCain-Feingold law did not apply to digital platforms. And so one of the most significant things that the Honest Ads Act would do is it would take that same electionary communications provision and it would extend it to apply to digital ads. So if you ran the equivalent of the call Bob Dole and tell him to stop scaring seniors ad on um, a digital platform, uh, then 
that would uh, count the same way as if it was broadcast on TV or uh, on the radio. Got it. So it, it sounds like you have a concern, if I'm reading your earlier comment correctly, that that if we do um, extend those requirements, there's it's going to be hard to police who the actual source of the ad is. Is that right? Well, so well, so uh, no, not not that's not my main concern because in okay. addition to uh, barring foreign entities from spending on these. Um, there is also the uh, there are disclosure provisions, and so we should be able to figure out who's paying for these ads, and it would really task the uh, online companies like Facebook with figuring it out. My concern is that a lot of the activity that the Russians apparently engaged in was neither express advocacy, you know, vote for uh, Clinton, nor was it an uh, uh, an electionary communication call Bob Dole. It was instead stuff that was meant to get people. Uh, riled up about the election, um, you know, Black Lives Matter or immigration or gay rights, those were the three big areas, uh, intended to affect the economic election, but not covered by this. So Facebook, uh, in a post that it put up last week before uh, Mark Zuckerberg's testimony, put out a statement where they basically said, um, we are going to police these issue ads too. But they provided no detail as to how they're going to do it. Are they going to bar foreign entities from doing this? How are they going to figure out who's paying for the ads? What if somebody forms a group called Americans for a Better America and runs these ads? Are they going to try to pierce that and figure out who's actually behind it? And so I do think there are a lot of questions about for whatever is not covered by the Honest Ads Act, what is it that the uh, that entities like Facebook are going to do to actually make sure that well, one, we know uh, who's running and actually paying for these ads. And two, uh, that uh, we're not getting undisclosed foreign influence over our elections. Right. And I, I guess that sort of gets to my next question. Uh, I put something in the rundown uh, about a study that found that 66% of tweeted links to popular websites were shared by bots. That's a pretty high number. Uh, and and I wonder uh, what your take is uh, on the willingness of lawmakers to perhaps require, you know, put more uh, pressure on social media platforms to require them to police activity like that. Well, so I don't think that's in the Honest Ads Act, at least the version I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, there have been proposals that when someone is uh, creating a bot and the bot is doing something that has to be clear that it is a bot. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that would, you know, I think people knowing that information would find it useful to know that uh, there, someone is trying to manipulate them and it's not a, you know, just a person, oh, isn't this interesting? Uh, but it's not clear to me how far Congress is willing to go on this. And it's not clear to me at some point, we haven't gotten into this, um, there are going to be questions as to whether or not these laws, if, if these are mandatory coming from Congress, whether or not they violate the First Amendment. Certainly getting rid of bots or making it harder to use bots is going to interfere with the business model of Twitter and other companies as well. I think by the time we don't have signatures or driver's licenses anymore, the bots are going to be pretty good at fooling us. Well, maybe they can vote. <laughs> take us out of the equation. Well, maybe they can run for office. One bot, one vote. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> just to just to defend the bots here briefly. Uh, when, when you're when you're building an online campaign, you're you're going to use, and I, I just mean this in a business sense, not in like a uh, uh, election campaign. But you're going to set up your work for your workflow so that you build out various Twitter posts or Facebook posts, and then you have, um, you know, the bot actually implement them uh, at the optimal time that you can reach your most customers. So the number, you know, saying that 67 or whatever percent of uh, poster posted by bots isn't surprising because that just means you're optimizing what your content is. Um, that that that's not like necessary. I mean, you're just you're doing better advertising. Um, you know, maybe that's manipulation, but that's that's advertising. Um, so, I, just that all that is not necessarily nefarious. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Uh, Mike, any thoughts? Um, you know, Rick, I had a question in particular about in-kind contributions. I mean, that's been in the news so much lately with the Stormy Daniels and the National Enquirer issue. Um, and I was hoping maybe you could clarify at least a question that I have when it comes to in-kind contributions to campaigns. If the National Enquirer, for example, um, acted on its own without any knowledge of the Trump campaign and made these various payments, is that something that would be an in-kind contribution regardless of whether they were communicating with the campaign? Or is that something is that something different? Well, so first of all, we have to differentiate between contributions and expenditures. Contributions are done in coordination with a candidate, in cooperation with a candidate. Expenditures are done not in that way. And so uh, if Trump had no knowledge of it and Trump's agents had no knowledge of it, it would not count as a contribution. Uh, whether it could be an unreported expenditure would depend on whether or not the special rules that apply to the press would apply to the National Enquirer company at the time it is doing this. And it's not clear to me uh, that necessarily would. I think that's going to be a difficult question that uh, may or may not be answered. It's the same question that's come up with uh, the um, issue of the, uh, the payment by Cohn to Stormy Daniels. Uh, he's not press. Uh, if he did it in cooperation with Trump, he's making an in-kind contribution of $130,000, potentially, if his motive was to help the election of Trump as opposed to help Trump personally. And that may be one of the things that they're looking at uh, going down the road. Uh, one of the interesting pieces that we flagged for this week's show uh, is at Slate uh, in their future tense column. It's called, Are Algorithms the New Campaign Contribution? And it's an interesting read. And and I think the the overarching premise is uh, and I'm sure this is not unique to algorithms, but there are ways uh, that you can assist a campaign substantially uh, that's completely not a financial contribution. How do you think the laws uh, as they exist today, Rick, are set up to handle that reality? Well, you know, as technology changes, it's not clear to me exactly how things are going to go in terms of how we treat these new technologies. But what mm -hmm. we've said in the past is that money is different. It's uniquely fungible. And the big concern is that someone's going to give money and get uh, uh, undue influence over a, a, a candidate or is potentially going to um, have too much influence uh, over uh, what policy is put in place. Um, and at the very least, we want to have disclosure of who's paying for all of this so that we know uh, so, so that the public can judge whether or not uh, someone is being influenced or, 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 or how they should vote. And so uh, the concern about algorithms being the new uh, campaign donation, is big money going to change hands? Because if it's a technology that's really cheap and anybody can do it, uh, then there's less of a concern from a campaign finance perspective that this is being used to try to influence the outcome of elections. There may be other concerns about our democracy and how we make decisions. But it's not, it doesn't really raise the same questions as someone getting undue influence because they have uh, the, you know, the, the unique ability to use money to turn it into whatever it is that they need for a campaign. Uh, I, have, I have another question. I don't know if it's related to what we're talking about here or have talked about here today or not, but I think it's really interesting. It's something, I forget if you tweeted or blogged about it, uh, but it has to do with what the state of Maine is trying as far as ranked choice voting. Could you describe that for us? Sure. This is a totally different topic. Happy okay. To about it. So, the, so uh, most elections in this country uh, are conducted uh, where we, uh, we have a, it's called a first past the post or plurality system. So if there's 10 candidates running for an office, whoever gets the most votes wins. Um, that creates situations potentially where you don't always get your first uh, or second choice as a candidate. So let's take the Florida 2000 election uh, for president. There were more people who voted for Gore, Al Gore, the Democratic candidate, and Ralph Nader, the Green candidate, than voted for George W. Bush. And so Bush may have been the third choice of most of those voters. And so a majority of voters is getting uh, their third choice. 
to follow my logic there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are systems to try to deal with this. And one of these systems is referred to as ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting. And the way it basically works is like this. Uh, if you, you run this election, all the candidates run for president. If nobody gets a majority of votes, you take the, uh, the people who voted for the bottom ranked candidate and you look at their second choice. Because when everybody votes, rather than voting for just their first choice, they vote for their first, second, and third choice. And so you take their second choice votes and you reallocate them to the remaining candidates. And you keep doing this from the bottom going up to the top until somebody hits 50%. And this is a system that is supposed to lead to better results in terms of representing the uh, favored views of a majority of voters. And they're doing this in San Francisco. They're now going to be doing this in Maine. There's been a lot of legal wrangling and there are all kinds of technical issues because you have to count votes differently in terms of the, the machinery for all of that. Uh, but in Maine, uh, they're going to move to the system. They're going to try it out. And uh, uh, a lot of resistance from the legislature. But uh, voters want it. And we're going to see how it goes. Well, I think it does probably relate to what we've been talking about because this is yet another thing that could be manipulated, right? Who's ranked where and... How yeah, it's so counted. About strategic voting and all of that, sure. But, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think the main issue with this is really the question, um, is this a better way to aggregate people's preferences rather mm -hmm. than, for example, having a system where the minor party candidate ends up being called the spoiler, you know, the one who stops Al Gore from being president. But, you know, what the response I get from Ralph Nader people is, Gore stopped Nader from being president. You know, why are you <laughs> saying that he's the spoiler? But uh, right. you know, it certainly does raise uh, questions about uh, there's nothing inevitable about the voting system we have. We just have this long history of having it. Um, right. There are, you know, there's talk about moving towards more proportional representation systems for choosing uh, representatives uh, rather than mm -hmm. using districts, which would solve some of the gerrymandering problems. But, right. uh, you know, because we have this decentralized system, these are generally things that happen state by state. And on the congressional level, there's actually a, a federal statute going back to one of the earlier questions. Here, Congress did step in and say, you must elect your representatives from single member districts. That is, uh, you can't have, uh, you know, elect a whole bunch and use some kind of proportional system. So is this in Maine just for their um, state representatives? Yes, that's right. Yes. Can't, cannot they, be used for Congress. No. Rick, Our, uh, Go My assumption would be that the main system would uh, lead to uh, politics being more dispersed and less centralized. There's an incentive I involved in if you're running a uh, more of a two candidate system where one is going against another that you're 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 necessarily or you're likely, although we haven't necessarily seen it lately, that in, in when you the closer you come to election, the more you're going to move to the center. Um, and, and there's certain benefits to that. It would seem that the the stacked or the tiered or um, your ability to vote for three candidates would would lessen the incentive to do that. Um, it, is my assumption of that correct? Well, we'll see when we actually see how the voting goes. But yeah, uh, one of the arguments in favor of this is that it makes candidates who are say the Democrat or Republican try to cater to people who have uh, other first choices. So if you're a Republican, you might make some libertarian noises to try to be the second choice of the libertarian candidate. Or if you're the Democrat, you might uh, make some concessions to try to appeal to the Green Party candidate who might be on the ballot. Uh, this does seem to potentially move these candidates away from the center, but at the same time, um, it does help to assure that more people are satisfied with who the ultimate winner is compared to a system where just the plurality winner can squeak by. You know, I was just reading the story uh, in the New York Times this morning about Claire McCaskill, who's the senator from Missouri. And, um, and the, the, she's uh, you know, considered one of the most endangered senators. And the last time she ran for office, she ran ads while the Republican primary was going on saying that Todd Akin, who was this very controversial conservative character, was too conservative for Missouri. And the reason she ran those ads was to advertise Todd Aiken as the true conservative in the race and to get help pick her opponent. And she was successful. Aiken got the um, Republican nomination and she went on to beat him handily. And so um, I think as long as we have elections, we're going to have people try to manipulate whatever the rules are to try to get the best outcome for themselves. <laughs> 
yeah, it'll just be interesting oh. to watch to see how it changes. N- not necessarily that's good or, or bad in either way. It's just um, a- any system is going to change how you game it. Um, so it'll be fascinating. Yep. It will indeed. Uh, we are blessed to have Rick Hassan with us here today. I'm sorry, I've been mispronouncing your name, Rick. <laughs> I think I've got it right now. Uh, today, not just because he's a an expert in all things election law, uh, but also, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, a Supreme Court scholar who has written a book about this, uh, one of the Supreme Court's most illustrious justices. Uh, and uh, so I thought we should seize the opportunity to talk about the current Supreme Court term and the tech law and policy issues that are on the court's docket. We were talking at the, uh, before we went on the show with you all today about how slowly the Supreme Court uh, seems to be handling its caseload this year. Do you have any comments about that, Rick? Yeah, there must be something going on behind the scenes because um, they're really slow. They've got some very big cases. We saw from mm-hmm. the argument in the second partisan gerrymandering case out of Maryland last month that they really seem to be struggling with that case. And so um, by now they should have produced more opinions. It means maybe we're going to have a huge June or it might mean that some cases will be put on till next term. Uh, mm-hmm. There are rumors about justice not getting along, but you know it really is a black box. We don't know what's going on at the court, uh, other than by looking at their output, right? And their output is down, way down. Right. Um, You had an interesting case, the Husted case that you wanted to share some information with us about. Could you tell us about that? Sure, this is uh, A. uh, Philip Randolph Institute versus, uh, I think it's pronounced Husted, but you know, we all all mispronounce last names. So (laughs) uh, I certainly do all the time. Uh, He's the Secretary of State of um, Ohio. Um, And um, uh, this case concerns, it's again a voting case, but it does raise technology issues. Uh, When can you remove people from the voting rolls uh, uh, if uh, you're concerned that they've died or moved and they're still on the rolls? And so Ohio has taken the position that uh, it can remove people who haven't voted in a few elections. And it's a very technical dispute, which uh, revolves around the something called the National Voter Registration Act of 1993, more commonly known as the Motor Voter Law, which sets up federal rules for how you can purge voters. But it does raise, I, 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 th- I thought of it as a kind of technology case because it does raise the question, how do we know when a voter is still an eligible voter? We don't have a national database. We don't have a national voter ID card. So, you know, so we don't know. And so states try different things to try to clean their voter rolls so that they remove people who are no longer eligible. The the way that Ohio is trying to remove its voters goes against longstanding federal interpretation under both the Republican and Democratic administrations, longstanding federal interpretation of what the NVRA or the motor voter law requires. Uh, you have to do certain things to get information from voters before they, uh, or try to get information before they can be removed. What's especially interesting about this case is that it's one of a number of cases in which the Trump administration has reversed longstanding DOJ policy. Uh, in this case, uh, when, when it was still the Obama administration, they were on the other side. And so, uh, you know, there are questions about um, uh, the credibility of the Department of Justice and the Solicitor General's office when it keeps changing side in these cases, thanks to the change in administration and the change in views. Um, but it's a difficult problem without a centralized database figuring out what are the rules going to be, because the danger is that you remove eligible voters from the voting rolls, people who've just decided not to vote. So one of the uh, um, uh, plaintiffs in this case was someone who was on uh, active duty uh, uh, over in the Middle East for the for the uh, uh, you know the United States Armed Forces didn't vote for a while and he came back tried to vote and found that he was removed from the voting rolls simply because he hadn't voted in a couple of elections and didn't respond to a postcard uh, so it's a hard question do you err on the side of uh, 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 removing people who might be um, eligible to vote, or do you err on the side of leaving them on, even if they're no longer going uh, to be around because they've moved or they're no longer alive? So one of the considerations in this case uh, maybe echoes one of the things you mentioned earlier, Rick, and that is 
suppose someone is registered to vote and they're registered as a vote by mail voter um, and they've moved and uh, their ballot arrives, but they're not there to get it or maybe they're still getting their mail. So maybe they have the opportunity to vote at their prior address and in the new state where they've moved, they can actually vote twice, uh, getting back to the voter fraud uh, issue about um, ballots by mail that we were talking about earlier. Is that implicated here at all? So there are efforts now um, to try to match across states to try Mm -hmm. to remove voters who've moved. Uh, Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen occasionally that uh, voters um, uh, will have moved or died or something and someone else votes their ballot. There was a very interesting case a few months ago involving a um, guy who was the head of the, uh, at one point, the head of the, uh, a, 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 I think it was a county uh, 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 a part of the Ohio Republican Party. And he was on the radio years ago saying that only Democrats commit voter fraud. Turns out his, uh, I can't remember if it was his ex-wife or his girlfriend's, ballot had come to his house and he voted that ballot. Uh, <laughs> and, and he claimed he must he have voted Democrat it, then. Uh, he claimed he had done it in a diabetic uh, fit. Wow. Um, <laughs> okay. And he didn't remember doing it. Wow. Um, and he was convicted. Um, so these things happened, but it was, you know, comically ridiculous that here's the guy, this almost never happens. Here's the guy that claims that only Democrats commit voter fraud and here he is committing voter fraud and then comes up with what seemed to be the flimsiest excuse you can imagine uh, for having done it. Hilarious. That's great. Um, all right. So uh, any questions, Matt or Mike, about the Houston case? Um, I don't have any questions about that. This question I have is maybe a bit far afield, but um, Rick, you, you mentioned your, your book that you recently published on Justice Scalia, who's always been a very intriguing, fascinating figure, I think, to a lot of us that watch the court. Um, but how would you characterize uh, or summarize Justice Scalia's jurisprudence when it comes to voting rights and voting-related issues? Well, that's a great question. So uh, first here, I should do this, my little advertisement. There we go. <laughs> See that? There's the book. They did a great job with the cover. I do hope you judge a book by its cover because it's got a great cover. Um, <laughs> I actually uh, gave a keynote address, which is right near the top of my blog, uh, electionlawblog.org. Uh, I gave a keynote address a few months ago uh, in Chicago where I addressed that very question. Uh, Justice Scalia was uh, inconsistent when it came to the election cases. You know, I call him the justice of contradictions because there were many ways in which he said he had a single neutral philosophy, but came out different ways. I'll just give you one example. In the campaign finance cases, he he believed that all, all, virtually all campaign finance limits violated the First Amendment. And one of the reasons he said this was so was because of uh, incumbency protection. He believed these laws were passed to try to benefit incumbents rather than to try to make uh, elections better. And yet, uh, in the partisan gerrymandering cases, Justice Scalia was not bothered by incumbency. He thought, you know, that's just the way politics is played. And in fact, in Uh, In a case going back to the 1990s, a case involving political patronage, Justice Scalia dissented and believed that it would be constitutional for the governor of uh, Illinois as a Republican to fire the Democratic janitor uh, if he didn't belong to the party because he thought that it was important to have strong political parties and people's First Amendment rights were not all that important. So he was very inconsistent in terms of how he treated these cases. And also when it came to voting rights, uh, he was very hostile to the Voting Rights Act. And in fact, one of the last oral arguments uh, on a voting rights case that he participated in, uh, he was complaining about the renewal of the Voting Rights Act in 2006 by a 98 to zero vote in the Senate, which you'd think it would be a reason for the court to defer to uh, the Senate uh, on a law like this. But he called the law a perpetuation of racial entitlements. So uh, he, had, he had very strong feelings. He, was, he really believed that... Um, these acts were too race conscious and violated the equal protection clause. Okay. Wow. Uh, there was a case uh, coming up for argument next week that I thought was worth mentioning. Uh, it is called South Dakota versus Wayfair. And since uh, 
the payment of sales taxes on online purchases has been much in the news recently. Uh, this is a good case to keep an eye on. Uh, the current state of the law is uh, established by a 1992 case called Quill versus North Dakota. Uh, that decision affirmed previous rulings and law saying that a state can force a business to collect taxes for the state only when the business has a physical presence in the state. So um, there could be some shift in that law depending on what the Supreme Court does next week. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the arguments there, uh, particularly because apparently according to the government accounting office, 80% of taxes from internet retailers are already being collected. Uh, the largest states are already collecting 80 to 90% of the taxes that they could collect, uh, even under some new standard instead of the existing standard. Uh, 17 of the 18 largest online retailers are already collecting sales taxes, uh, regardless of uh, why they're doing so. So um, this will be an interesting one to watch. I'm just wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on this, Mike? No, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I think it is obviously an important, important decision as to whether Quill remains the uh, the proper the proper test. I mean, mm -hmm. with e-commerce being so prevalent and such a prominent part of our society today, this is going to be um, an important case. Uh, it sounds like, though, according to the the stats that you re were just uh, rattling off there, Denise, that a lot of mm -hmm. online retailers are already. Uh, collecting and and remitting sales tax for uh, for sales in various states uh, where they ship products. So I don't know, it sounds to me like um, even though it's a, a largely important case, it sounds like maybe um, as a practical matter, it may not have a lot of impact on some retailers that are already complying and, and sending in uh, state taxes anyway. I don't know. Right. You know what? I'm going to be interesting to see if this comes up at oral. Uh, interested to see if this comes up at oral argument next week or not. Uh, is this whole new wild west world of drop shipping that is happening in e-commerce? Do you guys know what this is? I, I know what drop shipping is in general, mm -hmm. but is there some unique twist on it? Well, I think it it probably has a bearing on whether and how sales taxes are collected. It's basically arbitrage for where um, someone can obtain an article more cheaply and get it to you. I had never even heard of it. And then uh, it was last week or the week before, I had placed an order from a third party Amazon seller. And what arrived at my house was a box packaging tape, the whole nine yards from walmart.com. Oh, and I went, right. I didn't order anything from Walmart. And I opened it up and it was the item I had ordered from this Amazon third party seller who was basically, you know, looking to make a profit off the fact that they could buy it more cheaply from Walmart. Uh, posing as me, I suppose. They provided my information that they had access to because they were an Amazon seller and uh, have that item shipped directly to me. So that's one example of, of drop shipping. And, and you know, if, if people are um, doing this at volume, I'm sure there are ways in which, you know, one party might, you know, the overarching seller here, it was Amazon, might collect sales tax, but whoever the the person who actually winds up shipping the product might not. And then the other piece is, uh, the other piece that seems really interesting is the way in which um, this plays out on Instagram. Uh, very small, maybe just a, a print or manufacturer on demand sellers using Instagram to um, place orders and and again, maybe drop ship from, uh, some third party that you have no idea that you're doing business with that's probably in China. And again, the whole sales tax thing seems really uh, attenuated <laughs> in that circumstance. So I just, I think it's a, a an interesting twist in the world of e-commerce. I haven't really been interested in the world of e-commerce for a really long time. It seems like 
that uh, those systems had been established and working along like clockwork, you know, with the exception of this issue of are we charging the proper sales tax or not. Um, and now I just, I feel like this drop shipping trend is poised to disrupt some of that. Sorry, long tangent and rabbit hole, but um, something we'll hopefully pay attention to uh, either uh, maybe it comes up in this case next week, or uh, maybe there are various legal considerations that we'll explore about that as time goes on. Uh, Matt, any thoughts about Wayfair? Yeah, just that uh, from from my perspective, it seems like uh, from an from an equity perspective that you you know if you're designing a system, you don't want it so that if you're an online seller that you can essentially pick where you're going to ship from uh, based on the the cheapest tax rates of the people you're shipping it to. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas you know a a local retailer a, you know basically can't have that advantage. It it seems like you want to tax based upon where. Um, the item is being shipped to or it's being purchased at. Um, that way you don't get uh, imbalances within the market um, as, as a result of uh, sort of sort of sort of opportunism. Um, it, th- that would be that, that, that seems to make more sense to, to me, um, especially if you're looking at areas where you know there's multiple states uh, close to one another. So right here we have Indiana, um, Illinois and Michigan and, and a lot of you know, Indiana benefits because uh, we we have a lower tax uh, rate in, in, for some items and and so shipping from South Bend to Illinois or Michigan it's it's a good hub here but that doesn't seem to make sense um, it seems like you want the tax revenues to come from where the item is being shipped to uh, which hasn't been the case for um, for years and and just to the point of this is a a small item so if we're talking about ten percent of all uh, that's being shipped um, you know through e-commerce we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. So uh, mm-hmm. uh, while this is fractional, you know, it seems like uh, the statistics point that th- these taxes are being imposed. We're still talking about huge, huge dollars. Yep, indeed. All right. Uh, one other Supreme Court case that we've covered over the last several months as it's wound up in the Supreme Court and was argued there uh, is the Microsoft Ireland privacy case. Uh, so Let's take a moment to look at what's going on there. So you'll recall this case was argued recently. Uh, It's the one where um, the Department of Justice was attempting to get some information uh, in connection with a drug arrest uh, from an email account where the information was stored on Microsoft servers residing physically in Ireland. Uh, And there was oral argument uh, at which the court expressed skepticism as to Microsoft's position was that uh, they did not have to supply the information because it was not uh, physically available to them in the United States. And there might be uh, concerns about the law in Ireland Uh, about disclosure of that information, uh, taking precedent. Well, uh, as we discussed at the time of the argument, uh, the um, folks in Congress were hoping to do something about this. Even uh, the court expressed some desire that Congress should really weigh in and make some statement about how all this should work. And they did, Uh, they enacted the Cloud Act. Uh, They tacked it on to the recent $1.3 trillion omnibus spending bill at the last minute. Uh, Cloud stands for clarifying lawful overseas use of data. And under that act, the Department of Justice would be entitled to um, the information that it's looking for. There are various considerations about how the Cloud Act will function. Um, It is uh, supposed to enable the US to make bilateral agreements with countries uh, that the US deems those agreements advantageous with uh, that would govern um, how data could be turned over in response to an overseas court approved search warrant. Um, And uh, if there was no such bilateral agreement in place under the Cloud Act, then uh, 
Microsoft or other companies would simply have to turn over the information uh, in compliance with a court ordered US warrant. So uh, there are a lot of people who are concerned about um, this act. I, I expect that it will come under some sort of constitutional challenge sooner rather than later. So procedurally, as far as the Supreme Court goes though, both Microsoft and the Department of Justice, the two parties in the case, have asked the court to uh, dismiss this case, not to rule, not to issue an opinion uh, during this slow term where it seems to be having some trouble getting opinions out. Uh, and and to punt on this one that they say, hey, you know, Cloud Act takes care of us. Thanks, court, for your time, but no need to do anything on your end. Although I guess the Department of Justice has some procedural things with the lower courts that uh, it would like the court to uh, give some direction on. But uh, I'm I'm just wondering if people think, you know, is this court busy term, chance not to write a big long opinion and figure all this out. Is it going to take that opportunity or might it take the opportunity to lay into the cloud act or what do you think is going to happen here, Mike? Boy, hard hard to know for sure. I mean, it looks like both parties have requested that the that the case be vacated, and I'm not sure what the request uh, was of DOJ if they're asking that the appellate court decision be overturned or, and vacated. But uh, you know, it's it does raise an interesting question as to how the mootness doctrine comes into place in federal court litigation. I mean. Both parties are saying it's it's now a moot case, that the case is now decided by the Cloud Act, so therefore Supreme Court dismissed the case. Of course, the court could could find otherwise and say, well, no, there's still a, a potential case in controversy here that at least could repeat itself in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure based on my understanding of the case if that's, if that's likely or not. It, it seems to me, though, that this particular issue has been resolved by the Cloud Act based on the the party's submission. And I, I would suspect that the court's not going to issue a substantive discussion or opinion with respect to the issue now that it's at least appears to be moot between these two parties. But that's obviously reading tea leaves and, and that's just my rank uh, speculation. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Matt, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, uh, it seems like they're going to decide not to decide the case because um, one, it, it really wasn't like on, on a day to day level, this wasn't an issue that uh, really pushed the pushed the ball on on privacy. So I think that there's you know only a handful of cases where this actually applies to. And it's when your data as a U.S. citizen is stored being stored overseas. And, and the question is whether we can Microsoft basically send send their protocol, which tells a bot in Ireland to fetch the data that happens to be in Ireland? Um, and, I, and you know, when you listen to oral arguments, the 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 court was like really drew on that line of saying, okay, you're having a bot do something in Ireland. You're not asking a person to do it. You're not asking the foreign government to do it. And and it it you know it's an American citizen. So um, you know the number of cases that this applies to is 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 really low. It seems like if you want to be concerned about privacy rights, that what you really want to push is the warrant requirement of what it takes to to get a warrant to search someone's data. Um, that's what's going to push the ball on this. Um, and in in having you know these these extra territorial issues, what the, the problem is that is it can set up uh, uh, you know the same sort of incentives with the the tax case is that you can have incentives to build systems that are outside the United States to protect information for people who are actually trying to get it protected um, you know for, for whatever reason where a warrant would would, would have applied um, now sometimes it's going to be someone protecting um, a whistleblower and other times it's going to be um, someone protecting you know something uh, a, a drug trader and something more nefarious and it seems like we should be more concerned about the warrant requirement than where the where the data is stored um, and and so that's 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 just my take on it. Okay, thanks for that, Rick. Any thoughts? Well, I, I can't really speak to the substance of it. It's way outside of my area. But uh, I, I, if I'm remembering right, this is one of the cases where DOJ is asking for the lower court decision to be vacated so that it will no longer be valid precedent. And we saw this in mm -hmm. some of the travel ban cases as well. It's this Munsingware uh, doctrine. Uh, and so it might be that even if the court agrees, uh, both parties say uh, it's been mooted by this uh, new law, 
that there's going to be a disagreement at the Supreme Court about how to treat the lower court opinion. So that's something I'll be keeping my eye on. Yeah, I I think that's a really good point. Um, we will keep our eye on it too. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, get to our concluding material of the show. Uh, we'll start with our animal selfie of the week. <laughs> Uh, just as a reminder, in case this is your first time ever uh, tuning in to This Week in Law, why do we have an animal selfie of the week? Uh, we do because of interesting laws and recent legal proceedings about whether or not animals can hold the copyright to uh, photographs that they take themselves, uh, either by operating a camera themselves or triggering an automatically uh, set up camera. Uh, here we have uh, a couple in the UK, I believe, uh, who got married and decided that uh, the person they wanted to be the videographer at their wedding was their dog. So they uh, fixed their dog up with a GoPro and let it film the wedding. And uh, mm. so they have um, footage of their wedding proceedings taken by their dog cinematographer. Here's some of it for you. That's kind of delightful. <laughs> <laughs> This was fun in, in the week that we learned who the invitees are for the royal wedding. <laughs> um, I doubt I missed that... my envelope. I missed my invitation. Oh, no. I, you got to check again. Maybe maybe voter fraud is responsible. I think so. You're missing envelope. <laughs> um, so here we the dog is uh, actually the um, making the. Uh, Cinematograph cinematographic choices here mm -hmm. definitely is the director of the film, uh, although probably does not know this very well and is just going around being friendly to the guests and getting some wedding cake on its nose. Uh, any thoughts, Mike? <laughs> well, um, I just hope that uh, the dog was paid a fair wage for all of those great uh, services. That's right. Mm -hmm. Wedding videos do not come cheap. All right, we have a couple of tips of the week. Uh, the first one, in keeping with our uh, theme for today's show, we talked a bit about selfies at the polls already, uh, but there's a great piece in the Journal Sentinel uh, covering was the state of Wisconsin uh, about various uh, things that have come up before the Wisconsin Election Commission that uh, might be illegal or improper under Wisconsin's election laws. Uh, there are some uh, various fun things in the article, including uh, whether a bake sale was properly positioned at the poll uh, might have been construed as apparently they got a complaint because they thought that the bake sale might be blocking access to the poll <laughs> and maybe should have been positioned after the voting rather than before. Uh, but my favorite uh, part of the complaints that uh, the election commission in Wisconsin received uh, was the person who wanted to bring a cage of ducks into the polling place uh, and wanted to put a sign on the cage saying, if you don't vote, you can't squawk. Uh, the election commission decided no, that that had to be kept more than 100 feet away from the polling place if the person was determined to have their ducks nearby. Rick, uh, anything you want to add about ducks or <laughs> anything else at the polling place? I was just very happy to see the duck was not taking a selfie. Oh, nope. Which would have no ducks oh, yeah. Not That'd of the duck's ballot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I imagine uh, that you've heard some fairly obscure, strange things uh, going on in connection with polling places that these election commissions throughout the country have to deal with. Well, you know, there's actually uh, a case pending before the Supreme Court, uh, which we didn't talk about, called Mansky, about uh, a guy in Minnesota 
who uh, wanted to wear a Don't Tread on Me t-shirt. And you're not allowed to wear anything political to the polls in Minnesota, mm-hmm. which is broader than some other states' laws. And the court has to decide if that's overbroad and violates the First Amendment. So um, poll apparel is a big issue that the Supreme mm-hmm. Court's working on this term. Wow. Got it. Well, I guess our tip that we're distilling from this is keep your ducks especially in Wisconsin, 100 feet away or more (laughs) from the polling place. Uh, Our other tip of the week, uh, and this is a fun one, sort of echoes uh, the various uh, AIs that have beat human chess players and Go players over the years, much to people's consternation and amazement. Well, it turns out that there is a legal AI platform called Law Geeks. And it set up a test uh, with professors from Stanford University, Duke University of Law, and the University of Southern California. And the test involved pitting this Law Geeks AI against a group of 20 experienced lawyers. They were given four hours to review five non disclosure agreements. There were 30 issues, 30 legal issues, including things like arbitration, confidentiality, et cetera. Uh, that were in these agreements and the AI and the lawyers were scored by how accurately they identified each issue. Now the AI, it turns out, ate the lawyer's lunch in a big, big way. Um, The uh, human lawyers had an 85% accuracy rate on average, while the AI achieved 95% accuracy. The AI took only 26 seconds to complete the task. Uh, The human lawyers averaged 92 minutes. And the AI also got 100% accuracy on one of the contracts. Uh, The highest scoring human uh, only got 97%. Uh, So um, our tip from this is you better call your AI, I guess, (laughs) because it's... uh, far more equipped to figure out the legal issues in a contract. And I guess um, actually against the backdrop of the uh, Senate and congressional hearings this week that focused a lot on people's ability to read and understand contracts uh, that deal with their important rights that they may be forfeiting, uh, maybe this is a good sign. Maybe all those uh, those answers that were given about um, AI coming to the rescue for various problems. Maybe it will come to the rescue on the contractual understanding side as well, because um, apparently this one did quite well, uh, not only understanding better than a regular human could, but beating a team of lawyers uh, trained to evaluate contracts. Uh, Any thoughts, Matt? Yeah, so uh, we had a uh, course in the fall, which uh, was run by Ron Dolan, uh, who teaches here at Harvard, um, and and basically it was all about technology. And there, like the things that are being done in M and A and in those sort of fields to track contracts. Um, I don't know why I would ever want to hire, you know, as 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 someone who runs a company, why I would want to hire a bunch of you know, people straight out of law school to go through my due diligence. I, I just want to hire an AI to do it. That just makes so much more sense to me. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was amazing. I, I wish I could remember the the company that we looked at, um, but their stuff was just just amazing. Um, and and uh, you know, tracked everything, uh, built your systems for you, was able to like you know to watch it grow. It was so much better than like an uh, IBM Watson or something like that. Um, so yeah, the stuff coming in, in that in legal field for that is, is, is just so, so exciting. Mike, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I bet Matt though, that you wouldn't want that AI to try a case on behalf of your company though. Right. Or negotiate a settlement. Oh, so no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, well, it depends, I, on, the, that, it depends I, on the settlement. I, like, no, um, I, you know, I, I think that I, like there, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. But uh, you, you just, like lawyers are going to have to move to higher value things, and, and the higher value is the thinking and the strategy, and not going through contracts and seeing if all the terms are in them. Well, I think we already endowed bots with the ability to vote and run for office on this show, so why not try a case? <laughs> Rick, any thoughts? 
Well, I just hope that I'm continuing to teach human beings and not uh, bots for the rest of my career. (laughs) We hope that too. And continuing to write books, our resource of the week is The Justice of Contradictions, Antonin Scalia and the Politics of Disruption. Uh, Why did you decide to write this book, Rick? Well, that's a uh, six years ago, I was going to write a book called The Scalia Court. And it it really, um, it didn't gel. I put it aside, but I've, I've been fascinated by Scalia since I've started studying the law. And about two years ago, I uh, sent an email on a Saturday morning to my uh, my boss, Erwin Chemerinsky. I said, I think I'm going to pick up the Scalia project again. I really can't let it go. And he wrote me back a few hours later and said, the justice just passed away. And it was that day, February 13th, 2016. And so I knew I had to take on this project. And it, it took me outside my comfort zone, but I really enjoyed learning a bunch of different areas of the law and trying to figure out where Scalia fit into it and where things are going to go in the future. Because, and this is, I guess, is my final pitch. Um, Scalia is going to be bigger in death than in life. Mm. Well, we were, um, I, I suppose that people knowing that you've authored this book um, take great joy in sending you their thoughts and sometimes humor about Justice Scalia and there were a couple of YouTube videos that that showed up uh, in response to one of your tweets that I thought were worth sharing here, at least portions of them, um, about Justice Scalia and and the footprint, the huge footprint that he's left on American jurisprudence, um, and uh, some of the fallout of that. So why don't we play a, a bit of each of them? Who is this again, Rick? Can you tell us? The oh, artist? I can't remember who this was. Someone sent I this think, to me. The second I one think, I, that you have queued up, I know, is the uh, uh, Harvard uh, Harvard students, Harvard Law School students. Right. I bet people watching know who this is. I know Josh in the studio know who's, knows who this is and told me before the show he's even seen these guys. And there, oh, it says at the top, Coheed and Cambria. Does that sound? There we go. The court's in Justice Scalia's writing is serving as their lyrics here. Pretty fabulous, and uh, also just um, hilarious is this submission by students at Harvard Law um, to an above the law competition of some kind. Uh, do you know the context for this? Yes, Rick? The, the Law Review R E V U E. These are the humor submissions every year from law students to uh, above the law. But you know, m- most humorous law related video. Oh, Music wonderful. Video. So, so these were students at Harvard, and and I've actually we're not going to play the whole thing because it's almost four minutes long. But we'll start it in the middle, and I'll I'll set the stage for you by saying that uh, the protagonist of this video is a female Harvard law student with um, many progressive leanings, uh, wants to go into public law, be a warrior for social justice. And yet she finds that um, the favorite cases that she likes to read in law school are authored by conservative justice Antonin Scalia, and she's having much cognitive dissonance about this.
briefing, there's no one I'd rather read. Original is gangster, is what they're sure to say. I, I, I think Scalia's grandson is at Harvard, too, right now. So it would be great if he's one of these guys in the video. That would be. Oh, my gosh. That that made my night last night very, very funny. <laughs> so, the student um, who uh, was starred in that video sent a tweet where she said this is now, her, I think, the proudest moment in her law school career that uh, this yeah. video has been uh, discovered again. Yes, it's wonderful. Do you, is it a few years old now? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's uh, 2013. Uh, mm-hmm. But certainly it was when justice was still on the court is when it was done. Right. And it's it's just okay. a wonderful uh, statement to the fact that no matter how you feel about Scalia's politics, you cannot argue with the fact the man was brilliant and a brilliant writer and thinker. So um, anything else you want to tell us uh, about the book or uh, the book tour or anything else that's going on with you, Rick? Uh, well, I would just say that uh, if you go to electionlawblog.org and you look on the right-hand side, right under the picture of the book, I did a number of talks about the book, including with uh, Adam Liptak of the New York Times, Joan Biskupic uh, of um, CNN, uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, uh, uh, Adam Winkler. And so uh, on the right side, there are links to all of those videos, including one that was on C-SPAN. So if you want to hear more about the book, uh, click right there, electionlawblog.org. On the right-hand side, you'll see all of the links to the videos. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for letting us know. Uh, I am reminding myself I need a second MCLE passphrase for um, this show. So let's make it uh, no one I'd rather read from the video. I was and... guessing it was going to be a originalist gangster. but okay. <laughs> oh. Well, that would also be a good one, but we have to make these sort of tricky, right? No one I'd rather read, I think, is going to be it. So uh, I think that's it. <laughs> it's been a really fun show. Uh, I've learned a lot, Rick. Thank you so much for joining us today. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm very glad we were able to do it. I thought that maybe we'd had you on the show at some point in its almost 11 years of existence now. But I went back and looked through the archives and I couldn't find you. So excuse me for dropping the ball for that long. I've always intended to invite you on the show before this. Well, hopefully I'll get an invite back before the next 11 years. Yes, I I can guarantee you that. Rick Hassan, uh, so much uh, fun today. So much great information. Really, really appreciate you joining us on This Week in Law. Thank you so much. And Matt Curtis, great to see you again. I know you've been super busy. Anything you can talk about or shall we just stay tuned? There's there's nothing I can talk about, but uh, lots of of busyness uh, going on and all of that. Just to tee up another thing for next week is that there's a a great patent case coming up um, on lost profits arising out of – um, foreign foreign commerce, which will, which will be really interesting. And we had our patent exam on this question. So I'm really interested to see what the justices think about it. Oh, very good. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, you're reminding me though, next week we will not have a show. Oh. We will be dark next week, uh, but Perfect. we will be back the week after that. It's spring break. We have a terribly late spring break uh, here in the Southern California public school system for some reason. But we do this year, and we're about to go partake of it. How about you, Mike? Anything fun going on next week? Uh, no, we're we're past spring break. We're kind of in the spring push here, so we'll just be uh, we'll just be working hard. It was great uh, great being with all of you today, and Rick uh, learned a lot, and actually just purchased uh, a copy of your book, so I'm excited to read it. Thanks so much. I, just, I appreciate that. I'm I just sure got the all are. too. So uh, I was a little disappointed you weren't reading on it, but uh, otherwise I'm, I'm excited for it. The, oh, great. It, who it, does read it? Great, it's a guy named Jesse Einstein, who's a, uh, an actor and director and producer and did a great job. Uh, we've started exchanging messages on Twitter. So uh, he's somebody to follow. Jesse Einstein. Awesome. Cool. I'm looking forward to that too. All right, everyone. We really appreciate your joining us here at This Week in Law this week. This is episode 419. Uh, As I said, we'll be taking a break next week, but back the week after that. uh, If you do like to join us live for the show, we record at 11 o'clock on Fridays. That's 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1900 UTC this time of year. 
And uh, if you can't join us live, though, don't worry about it because you can head on over to our site at twit.tv slash twill. Our whole archive of shows is there for you to go through at your leisure. If you subscribe to the show in one of the various ways described there, it'll just pop up for you and be there uh, for you uh, new episodes as soon as they've come out. So however you join us, we're just thrilled that you do. Really, really happy to um, have such a great a uh, cadre of folks who join us week in and week out for the show. And if this is your first time, welcome. We hope you'll come back again. Uh, what else should I tell you? We love to hear from you between the shows. You can reach out to all of us by email. I'm Denise at twit.tv. Matt is Matt C at twit.tv. Mike is Mike at twit.tv. So let us know what's on your minds, uh, what you'd like to hear us talk about, guests you'd like to see us invite on more frequently than once every 11 years. Uh, anything at all that's on your mind, please do reach out to us and let us know. Uh, if email is not your thing or you're just going through your social media diet and stumble across something that you would like us to see, uh, real easy to just reach out to us on Twitter. I'm D Howell there. Mike is J. Michael Keys and Matt is Lawpint on Twitter. Uh, just, you know, flag it, let us know. We'll put it in the hopper for a discussion sometime in the future. Uh, Facebook too, we're at facebook.com slash this week in law. Uh, love to hear from you, however, wherever, whenever, and we hope to see you on our next episode of this week in law until then take care. Bye.